Hello, welcome to the live stream. I should have been looking here the whole time. Welcome to the live stream. I'm here with my beautiful wife, Brittany Bertuzzi. Hello. And we're talking about some apologetics terms, breaking down some top apologetics buzzwords is the way that I titled this. Basically, Brittany, my wife, is not an apologist. She's not super interested in philosophy and all the stuff that I'm interested in when it comes to apologetics and all that stuff. But she hears me say a lot of these words in conversations and stuff. And so she was the like, memes, the, the memes, groups. the groups and like Facebook posts and stuff. And so she's like, you know what? Why don't we just do a live stream where you kind of break down some of these terms that I see you use all the, t all the time, but I don't really know exactly what it means. Yeah, I want to I want to get the jokes. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> That's the main motivation. She wants wanna, to get the memes. <laughs> I want to get the memes. I want to make some memes, maybe. Whoa. I want to like. I did not know that was the motivation. I want to like your memes. Okay. A lot of times I just don't like them because don't I don't know, what, know what you're talking about. Okay. So maybe this will help. Maybe and I want to be a part of the conversation. Okay. All right. Well, let's get started. Let's start with the first one. Let's do it. Okay. So break it down for me like I'm five. Okay. <laughs> Explain it to me like, like I'm five. I'm five. Um, and then doesn't he go down to three? I think, three -year -old? I think he started above five. I thought he was, I thought five was the last the one. The last one. Okay. Anyway. So the first one, should I have a little list here. I literally, he was talking on the phone the other day. I heard him say one of these words and I was like, whoop, I'm adding it to my list. So I so think- So we have 11 total. So we have 11 and I'm going to, I'm just going to jump around on the list to okay. sort of throw you off because you oh. see my list. Okay. So I'm going to start with the Odyssey. Okay. What does that mean? Is that just a regular word or is that like a, a concept? The Odyssey is a very easy idea. It's just a reason that God has for allowing some particular suffering. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what the etymology is. I don't know why. Uh, so yeah, what is etymology? I don't know what that is. Etymology See is like... See what I'm talking about? I don't... Etymology is like the study of, of words. I don't know if that's right. But it's basically <laughs> how he, how you got that word. So like, where, where does it come from? Is okay, it, is right. it from like the Latin? Does it have a Latin right, root? Right, okay, or right. So I don't know what that... what Where it came from basically. Okay. But I know what it means. I know that a theodicy is just a reason that God has for allowing suffering. So an example, free will, you've probably heard that one. Mm -hmm. God had to, in order for us to interact as moral agents, is that a term that I need to explain yeah, no, to you? Got no? it. Got that got one? It. So in order for us to have the ability to choose between good and bad actions, we've got to have free will. Mm -hmm. And so that free will explains a lot of the suffering. Okay. So like when, when, you know, rape or these other really bad, terrible things happen, it's because in order to have free will, God could have just created robots and that, you know. Anyway, so that that's, okay, right. that's, so that's an that example. is just one example of one a example theodicy. Of a theodicy, exactly. I think that there are better ones than that one. Okay, well, we don't have to get into we that. We don't, because no. that's not the point. Nope, nope. nope. Okay, Kalam. This is one I Come see on. all the time. He has 10 gazillion shirts and hats and mugs about wanting to talk to people about the Cologne. Yeah. But I just want you to break it down to me in like basic. basic. Give me give me a one or two sentence. Okay. So Kalam is actually, it refers to a group of Muslim theologians. This is this already is too a, deep. This is already too deep. Okay. Just tell me what it is. Okay. Well... It's it, okay. So here's another way of, of doing it. I don't need to know it, origin. Okay. Here's another way of doing it. Well, no, that, that is what it means though. Okay. It refers to this Islamic group of people. Okay. Okay. But usually it's used in the context of a particular argument for God's existence. Okay. And that argument goes something like this. Okay. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Okay. The universe began to exist. So the universe has a cause. And so that is how the argument is usually understood these days. The Kalam cosmological argument. Okay. So say it again. So it's, so premise one, everything that begins to exist has a cause. That part's important for okay, a Okay, so there's a starter. Okay. So everything that begins to exist has a cause. Mm -hmm. Premise two, the universe began to exist. And then the conclusion, the universe has a cause. Okay. And then usually what happens at that point, after you get a cause of the universe, then the person, whoever's giving this argument, will then go on and say, well, look, a cause of the universe has to be like this. They have to have these kind of features. And, and people disagree that there's a cause? Mm-hmm. Do people disagree that there's a starter? Mm hmm That something... Mm hmm Okay, well, that sounds like a deeper conversation, yep. but... Yep, some people deny, yeah, there's, you can deny... People deny that, that there was a start? 
They didn't. Some people and deny. A starter. Some people deny that the that the universe began to exist. Some some atheists think the universe has been around forever. But didn't you don't have to, to be an atheist it. to believe that somebody had to start it. Somebody had to. Even if it existed, somebody had to put it into existence. Exactly. Something or someone. Some something had to cause it. Right. Because so there in, are people that don't agree that there's a. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well. Next. Okay, what's the next one? What's the next term? Ontological. Ontological. All right. Uh, so ontological. This is the one that I wanted to look up and like make sure that I had a good no, grasp of what it meant. Okay, because I use it all the time, and I probably you should do. have a better understanding. You of what do it use means. it all the time. But here's here's a a real easy way of understanding ontological. It's kind of like the study of things that exist or kinds of things that exist. So that's like a science term. No, not not exactly. It's a philosophical term. Is it? Mm-hmm. But stu- but scientists do study ontology because they study things that exist. But they they a lot of scientists probably don't even know about that term. I would I would guess because it is a very philosophical term. It's not really a scientific. It, is. it term. doesn't seem like a philosoph. It seems like oh, it sounds more scientific the, to you. The study of things. Yeah, yeah. The study of things that are here. Uh huh. The study of things that exist or types of things that exist. Maybe so there, like is someone, there a scientific word that's the same? It sounds like there would be a scientific word that's this. Maybe they can put it in the chat. Is there a scientific word out there that's the same as you ontological? Don't trust me. You don't trust me at all. No. Let's go to the interweb. <laughs> I don't think there is a scientific <laughs> word that means the same thing. Okay. Well, somebody maybe will contact. Yeah. Because it's still going to be a philosophical term, ultimately. Okay. Um, contingency. Contingency. So this is... This, I think I kind couple, of understand, but there's a couple ways that this one could go. It could go the argument route, which is the way that I did with the Kalam. So it can refer to an argument, or it can also refer to like a word that describes things. Okay. Okay. So here's how it describes things. So a thing is contingent if it can fail to exist. Another way to put that is it could be gone. So something is contingent if it could be gone. If, we, if I smashed your phone, could be gone. Mm-hmm. So that phone is contingent. This computer could smash it, could burn it, whatever. So this is a contingent thing. So anything that can fail to exist or go out of existence or hasn't always been here is contingent. Does that make sense? See, I thought it meant, and maybe it ha- has several meanings, mm-hmm. but something that it you could be- happen or could not happen. For example, it's we could go swimming today but that's contingent on the weather mm, mm. is it going to rain today is it going to storm so you're thinking of contingent there's there's two ways and this is actually you it's used this way in philosophy too so contingent can mean dependent it can mean yeah. dependent See, on something right. else yeah. so but it it actually does take on that meaning in the argument but usually what you want to do if you're giving an argument is be very specific about what kind of contingency you're talking about so you would say I'm talking about the contingency in the in the sense of this thing could fail to exist, or you're talking about contingency in the sense of this thing depends on something else for its existence. So you have so to it's clarify. A, it's a difference. Yeah, you've got to clarify because there's two different. Now, there's do you always two do different. that? Yeah, I do. I do. Typic- I typically do. What I, I won't. So sometimes I'll just give like one definition mm-hmm. and I won't mention the other one. Right. Okay. But I'll usually give the one that I because because contingency. When we use that in our everyday language, I think we normally mean it in the dependency type right. way. So I normally, if I'm using it in the other way, the philosophical way, which they're both still philosophical, but if I'm using it in the first way, then I always I always let people know that this is what I mean by contingency, is that it could fail to exist. And then the contingency argument moves from that fact to, it's, it's very similar to the Kalam cosmological argument. They're both, they both fall under like a broader category of argument called the cosmological argument. Is All that, that means, list? no, it's not. Okay. All that means a cosmological argument is that we're looking at the, the universe like as a whole. And we're wondering what type of you know conclusions can we draw about the universe as a whole, given certain features of it. So one of them, the Kalam focuses on a beginning mm-hmm. of the universe. Starter. Contingency focuses on all the contingent things in the universe. So like I just All the mentioned, things that exist. <clears throat> all the contingent things that exist. So, but in our experience, everything that we interact with on a daily basis is contingent, right? right? So like I'm contingent, you're contingent, phones, computers, cars, mountains, trees, water, 
everything is contingent, could fail to exist. We could steam water and make it go into separate, whatever. Anyways, you, you get the point, is that everything that we interact with is contingent. And then the argument moves from that fact to saying, well, look, every contingent thing that we know of has some reason why it's here. There's an explanation for it. Your phone was built in a factory by people, by machines, whatever, you know, there's a reason that your phone exists. And that also applies to every other contingent thing. There's some reason why the earth exists. So let's talk about non-contingent things. Non-contingent things. What are, what's an example of that? God. So another, besides God, you could say that some, some people think there are things called abstract objects, like numbers, mathematical equations and concepts. So it's, it's a yeah, real philosophical and weird, but that's one example that's not God, something that could be necessary. So some people and think could that could not fail to exist. Could, could not, not fail to exist. Yeah. So so an example, two plus two equals four. No, this is going too deep, babe. No, that's just the truth. No. Two plus two equals four. Yeah, yeah. But that has to be true, right? It has to yes. be true. That's it. Oh. Okay. So it's necessary. It has to be true, no matter what. Okay. So that's a necessary thing. If you think that thing exists. Let's go to moving on. Moral relativism, and then I had in parentheses objective morality because I didn't know mm. if those were like cousins or if is that They're the related. same thing or what? They both have morality. So moral <clears throat> relativism slash. Let's start with that. Oh, so they're two different things. So really, they're we have related. 12 things. They're related. On this yeah. List. They're okay. related, but they're different. Yeah. Moral sure. relativism. Go. Okay, moral relativism. So relativism, more generally, more broadly. Think about uh, taste relativism, mm, okay? Mm -hmm. So like someone says, I like chocolate ice cream. Another person says, I don't like chocolate ice cream. They're both right, they're both correct because they're describing their own taste, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So a moral a moral relativist, uh, one, one particular kind, I'm not gonna get into, into any details, but one particular kind of moral relativist would say that when we make a moral claim, like if I said abortion is wrong, mm -hmm. and you said abortion is that's a heavy one. You went it, for something really. Well, it's heavy. just an example. It doesn't. Okay. You wouldn't have to debate whether or not it's true. But someone says that abortion is right, they don't necessarily disagree because the first one is just expressing their own taste right. about morality. The other person is expressing their own taste about morality. That's an argument against moral relativism. Actually, is that we we seem to have disagreements, moral disagreements. But on a relativism. You are correct if you are accurately describing your taste. So just like the person who is like explaining oh, that they it's like... It's all relative. It's all relative, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's true relative. Moral claims are true relative to your personal taste. Right, okay. Yeah. But there so are some things that aren't, like laws. So laws are social constructs. Mm -hmm. Morality is different. Morality is, is uh, goes above and beyond so society. So, but here's here's one way to, uh, let's move on to objective morality. Because objective morality is a lot different than moral relativism. Moral relativism claims are true relative to like persons, right. people. Okay. Some people, it's broader than that. But anyways, that's that should get us started. Objective morality is the idea that there are truths of, like, there are moral truths that are true independent of our opinions or our tastes or distastes example so an example would be abortion is wrong if if that is true then it would be true regardless of what you think regardless of what i think that's a true claim and we can be right or wrong about that but it's not right relative to my personal taste right. and wrong and, and you know yeah right so okay so, so i've heard be, you say things like um if it's true that babies are human from conception mm-hmm then you saying that abortion is true or okay is wrong. Mm -hmm. And it would be wrong independent, independent of what you and me. Yeah, of what you and me Ob ob think objective. About it. Objective morality. Okay. So it's objective. It's not subjective. Right. Objective goes beyond our opinions, beyond our tastes, distastes. So objective morality. I just think about it in terms of facts. There are facts about morality. Just like there's a fact. It's a fact that Dallas is north of Houston, regardless of what anyone thinks. Regard, you, you can you're wrong about that. If you if you disagree, you may have some reason for some weird reason for thinking that Dallas is south of so Houston. So use that in a sentence because I want to be able to. I feel like this is one I could. Hmm. Uh. 
objective morality. So objective morality relates to another argument for God's existence. And it's one that I'm not particularly No, no, no. Just use of. it in a sentence so that I can, like, flex. Oh. Uh, you know that I'm really bad at this. <laughs> Coming up with things on the spot. <laughs> it is objectively morally wrong to torture kids for fun. Okay, so I'd have to add objectively morally. Is it objectively and morally? You could say there's an objective... Okay, uh, you could say there's an objective moral fact about so it's whether comma, or not objective yeah. comma moral. No, 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 no. It, objective is describing morality. Okay. So, it, I feel like we're spending too much time on this. I know, but I still want to just be able to use it in conversation, like. Um. So you could just say, you don't have to use that term. You don't have to use objective morality. You could just say there's a fact of the matter about this moral claim in question. And it's this, regardless of what you think. And you'd be objectively expressing... Objectively speaking. Objectively speaking. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Someone is right, someone is wrong. But it doesn't mean that both of us are right, or both of us are wrong. It means that this is what's right. It just right. means that there is a fact, and we can use the tools at our disposal to try to figure out what the fact is. Okay. Presupposition. Presupposition. Mm -hmm. So what was the context of you hearing this term? I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember. I literally like just follow you around and when I hear it or if I see it, I just wrote it down. Okay. So a presupposition. Presupposing. When you presuppose something, you come to a conversation with an assumption. Oh, I do that all the time. Mm -hmm. You presuppose a lot. <laughs> So presupposition <laughs> is a is an assumption or a belief that you have that you enter a conversation with. Okay. And that's just something you presuppose. And so there's a difference between presupposition and presuppositionalism, which is a view. Presuppositionalist. Presuppositionalist. That's a view. It's a view. And what that view is, it's a view about uh, apologetics, how to do apologetics. So presuppositionalists, as you now that you understand what a presupposition is, presuppositionalists say that you've got to assume that Christianity is true before you can enter into a conversation. So if they're talking with an atheist, they presuppose that Christianity is true, mm -hmm. and that's how they that's how they do their apologetics. Oh, instead of instead of the the more classical approach which is to not assume that's true mm -hmm. and just to give them sort of arguments. Well, yeah, and I mean, obviously an atheist is going to be more open to they're someone not, who's going in there. They're not, not yeah. pre in, in, presupposing things. Exactly. Yeah. An atheist is not presupposing that Christianity is true. Presuppositionalists, some of them will but actually But is an atheist argue, going into a conversation presupposing that atheism is true or that God does not exist? They're, they definitely have their own set of presuppositions. I, and I think that there's there's presuppositions we all hold. I feel like, yeah, together. I feel like it's so like, super here's, hard to like put. Yeah. So here's one, here's a presupposition that you and I and everybody goes into a conversation assuming. We believe that our brains are reliable. Oh, my brain is not reliable. It's not, babe. I mean, I mean, it's not. I mean, generally, Especially the past couple of months. So reliable doesn't mean infallible. Okay. Oh gosh. So there's a difference between reliability and and infallibility. So infallible is when you're just never wrong. Oh. So reliable reliable means you're right most of the time. Reliable means you're. Reliable oh. means right most of the time. Oh. Well, here's an example. So this morning you have mostly true beliefs about what you had for breakfast, stuff that you did this morning, mm -hmm. the fact that Cami is over at our friend's house right now. You have a lot of these true beliefs, okay? Mo most of our beliefs are about mundane things, about just things that don't really matter. But then when we start to have conversations that really matter, like religion or politics, at that point we really start to like weigh or, you know, how reliable our, our beliefs right, are. But right. most of the time when we're just doing normal things, just going throughout our day, our beliefs are formed and we don't really think twice about it. It's, most of our beliefs are like that. But at religion, we, we just emphasize those more. And so we think that, you know, they're just bigger or there's more, but there's not more. Most of our beliefs are just about mundane things. So that presupposition, getting back to the point, a presuppositionalist 
or some, something that we all presuppose is that our brains are generally reliable mm. when we're coming to a conversation <laughs> with somebody. Yeah. We all pretty much assume that. Atheists assume that. I assume that. Christians, Muslims, everybody yeah. assumes something like that. If you don't assume that, you're, yeah, you run into some problems. You better just not have a conversation with someone if you don't have that presupposition. All right, let's move on. Um, okay, Pascal's Wager. Pascal's Wager. And we've actually talked a little bit about this. I kind of... I, we have. I get it. We have, yeah, Pascal's Wager. But just say it again. So for those of you who may not know what Pascal's Wager is, it comes up a lot in these conversations. And atheists really like to use it as like target practice. They, they think that it's like the dumbest argument that's ever been proposed. Okay. And okay. so they like spend a lot of time tearing it down because it's, it's an easy target for them. But a lot it's of like, well, let me see. It's like um, if there's a teeny morsel of chance that Christianity is true, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you just be a Christian? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you just believe that? That's is one, that it? That's one version. Okay. It's one version. So what it does, Pascal's wager, because it, it involves a wager. So you're thinking about the potential risks and rewards right, of okay. this worldview okay on christianity if you believe christianity it's all these rewards right mm -hmm. you go to heaven eternity with god all that good stuff right the potential downside the risk of not believing in christianity if christianity is true is hell right whatever mm -hmm. your concept of hell it's a bad thing you don't want to do that you don't want to do that. you want to go to heaven anyway there's a lot of negative risk there so a high reward high potential risk high potential reward high potential risk and so the idea is that on atheism, if we're just looking at between Christianity and atheism, if mm -hmm. those if, pretend that those were the only two possible worldviews. Right. On atheism, there's not a whole lot of reward if you're an atheist and atheism What is, is true. the reward? There's, there's not a lot. And actually, there's studies that show that religious belief is actually more beneficial. Like, it makes people no, like, happier. But seriously, what is there any reward to atheism? What is it? I, they just believe you I, just I, die and you're just... That's it. That's it. I, I don't really see any upside to atheism. If atheism is true. That's just kind of a miserable way to live. But suppose, yeah, suppose that you don't believe in atheism. Okay. And atheism is true. Okay. What are the risks? What are, what's the downside of that? It's like the same on both on both sides. It's like there's not much a potential risk. There's not much potential reward. It's like there's not a whole lot of reason to do this thing. So there's a decision theory is a thing basically that philosophers use in order to make the most rational decision about something. So like you can use this to determine whether or not you should go gambling. Well, we were talking about this as opposed to masks or yeah. as it applies to wearing masks. Yep. Like mm -hmm. if the mask works. The potential. Yeah. Even if there's a slight chance that the mask works, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you put it on mm -hmm. if it could possibly not get somebody else sick, not get you sick. The potential reward or value is very high if it works. And if it doesn't work, what are you out on? You're out on the inconvenience of wearing a mask for five minutes in a store or however long, you know, if you're going to the grocery store, maybe a little bit longer. But that downside, the inconvenience of wearing a mask doesn't outweigh the potential benefit of wearing the mask and saving someone's life. Well, let's move on because we might there might be some non mask Yeah, well, I wanted to... There. I don't care. So it, at this That's point... That's true, you don't care. I don't care. At this point, <laughs> it would be good to talk about the 12 courses that we're doing right okay. now. We're Pascal's great. Wager. Yep, Pascal's Wager. Let me see if I actually have it pulled up here. So we're doing 12 apologetics courses for beginners right now, and this is available to any of our patrons uh, at the $10 amount or more. We're doing this 12 apologetics courses for beginners, and I'm, we're actually working on a better name for it. But anyways, at the at the very last, the last course here is Pascal's Wager with Dr. Liz Jackson. And we've already recorded it. It's already available. If you go to patreon.com slash capturing Christianity, the link is actually in the description of the video. You can go support the ministry. You can get access to all 12 of these courses. Almost all of them have been recorded. Almost all of them are available right now. So Pascal's Wager, if you want to get more information on what that argument looks like, an updated version of it, these are all for beginners. If you're just starting out on apologetics, it's perfect for you. And uh, as you can see, we didn't just talk about Pascal's Wager. We had a course on why apologetics matters, logic, argumentation, and probability. 
We talked about the Kalam cosmological argument earlier. We talked about the contingency argument. We haven't talked about fine tuning. We'll get to that in a second, actually. But all of these different things here, the argument for the resurrection with Dr. Mike Lacona, probably the one of the world's foremost experts on the argument. We've done all of these things and made them available to you guys. And in, uh, in return, you can support this ministry, make sure that we're continuing to grow and continue to do things. Right now, we're working on doing a conference. That's our dog, wants to go outside. Uh, we're working on doing a conference right now, our first ever Capturing Christianity conference. And the reason why we're building or raising funds is to actually bring Brittany on board full time to do our event planning and everything. And so that's that's the reason why we're raising funds and doing all of these extra things in order to continue to grow the ministry, bring it to the next level. She's not just going to be doing uh, conferences, which she's like the most amazing event planner on the face of the planet. I'm not exaggerating <laughs> when I say that. But we're in order to take Capturing Christianity to the next level, we've got to have some more help. Got to bring Brittany on board and be able to, to help out with it. So that's what we have going. I and promise I won't be answering any questions about any of these concepts. I think I'm going to let the dog out. Yeah, go, go ahead. Should I start an, another one or should I just... No, the point is for me to be able Filibuster to until you get back. Filibuster. <laughs> well, guys, I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to do Q&A. Today I was thinking about that. Should we do Q&A? Should we not do Q&A? If we did Q&A, I was thinking about getting some more terms from you guys. If you want to send in a term, maybe we can talk about it a little bit. I don't know. I did see that a super chat was sent in earlier, so I got to actually scoot back up in my uh, my comments section here and see if one was sent in. Yeah, it does look like one was sent in, but it looks like it was just a comment. It doesn't look like it was actually a question or anything like that. Uh, no, it was a question, but it seems completely off topic, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip it. All right, so Brittany's back. Okay. We'll get, to our, we'll get to our next term. Okay, so the next one, Calvinist. What is Calvinism? What is who is who are Calvinists? What do they believe? I know they're Christians. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a theological view. It's a view about the Bible, and they believe in predestination. Is the easiest way to put it. Okay. So God determines who is saved and who is not saved. It's not really up to you. It's not within your ability to choose if you're saved or choose if you're not saved. So, so that's he a, already knows whether we accept Christ? He already knows if we will, but he's also determined it. He's just given his grace to the people that he's determined will receive it. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I hope I'm characterizing Calvinism correctly. I'm pretty sure Calvinists are going to take issue with that. But the the basic focus point of Calvinism, and some Calvinists try to adopt, try to to say that it's still compatible with this. But it ultimately comes down to I think free will, whether or not you have free will to choose Christ or free will to reject Christ. So a Calvinist will say free will is an illusion. Some some Calvinists will say this. Let me I'll say it that way to include. because God already determined. God determined it, but also in addition to that, there's just no such thing as free will. Well, that kind of stinks because if you think about it, okay, so your brother is is was atheist, mm -hmm. okay, so then if he never comes to Christ again, if mm -hmm. he never says Jesus Christ died for my sins and I believe that he raised again, if he so then there's just no hope for him. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So it has because to do with. Already predestined that. Right? It's about he, salvation. Who. Yeah. How, how he we. He was going to reject. Yeah. Christ. And that's it. Mm -hmm. So, so the there's never view, any hope for you or anyone else or the Holy Spirit to come to speak to him. It's and, all up to God. God. God is the one who determines it all. And so we just have to kind of like leave it to, to God to, to do. So Calvinism is opposed to another view called Arminianism. These terms are way too big for explaining yeah. what they are. Yeah. So Arminianism is the view that basically it's a free choice. So we can freely choose to be part of God's, the corporate body who are saved, or we can freely choose to reject Christ. Do you have to be one or the other? other? Is there like a There's middle? a middle ground. There's a middle. There's a, the, so what are you? I'm the middle one. What's the middle, the middle one? one? The middle one is Molinism. It's another big term. Mole, mole, mole. Mole, mole. <laughs> Molinism is the view, it kind of tries to marry both of them. So it, on the one side, we still have free will, 
But God also knows what we would do if we were placed in certain situations. So mm-hmm. he knows what the future is, even right. if we have free will, okay. which seems to be actually biblically supported. It's like God has this kind of knowledge. And so if he has that knowledge, then it doesn't conflict with our free will because we're still freely choosing what we're doing. But God is also, what is what is the term I'm looking for? He's also sovereign and that he chooses what you know kind of world that he created, given the facts that he knows about what we would freely do in these situations. So that's kind of the middle ground that kind of marries Arminianism and I can Calvinism. get down with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's... it's uh, I'm so, a Molinist. Yeah, well, there, there, I'll, I'll also <laughs> mention this. There are problems with that view. So a lot of people are kind of moving away from that view back to Calvinism or back to Arminianism because there's just some weird things that are happening in there. I've even hosted debates on it. I was channel. about to say, maybe that's you should do a, a debate with a Molinist an Arminianist and a Arminianist, Arminianist and a, a Calvinist. Calvinist. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that be an I've Arminianist, done... a Molinist, and a Calvinist walk into a bar type situation? So I've actually done that. Not not with all three, but I've done it on Molinism. I've done a, a Calvinism debate recently. So no, you need the trifecta. Yeah. Well, my my stuff is mainly focused on atheism and arguments for and against God's yeah, existence. Yeah, but for my sake and other people that might mm-hmm. be interested, mm-hmm. why not? Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on. Okay, let's go to uh, naturalism. Mm. Naturalism is a term that I hate. Okay, first of all. that's a strong I hate, word. I hate naturalism. I even say that we shouldn't show, tell our kids to say that word because I don't like it. But I hate When it. has Cammie or Hendrix ever said naturalism? No, I mean hate. Oh, hate. Yeah, okay. I t- we don't want <laughs> our kids like, to use Why is my five-year-old word. saying naturalism? No, she's not. Uh, so naturalism, the reason, part of the reason why I don't like it is because it's very difficult to nail down and like get an actual definition of it. So I prefer to use the term atheist, atheism, and okay. just ignore the term naturalism, but it inevitably comes up. It, Are they synonymous? No, they're not. So an atheist just believes that there is no God. Mm-hmm. Okay. And atheist, yeah. some, some atheists will want to define it differently, but that's the easiest way to understand it. An atheist believes there is no God. A naturalist believes there is no God and nothing like God. So that's the part, that that's the additional part that they add in. So there's nothing like ghosts. There's no ghosts because that's kind of like God immaterial. How is a ghost like God? Well, it's, it's immaterial. Okay. So that's, it's still personal, but it's not made of physical stuff. So it's kind of like God in one, in a couple ways. That's why I don't like it because it's, it's very ambiguous. It's very, it's a very awful term. It's, it's really bad. Anyways, and, and a lot of people don't share my view. A lot of people think that naturalism is a great term to use. It means a whole lot of good things, but I just don't see it. But the, they still just don't believe in God. They don't period. believe in God, okay. but then, yeah, but then they also don't believe in some other things too. Okay. That's but that's, fine. yeah, that's basically it. So then what's the point of using the term in the first place? Cause you don't know what this person believes or doesn't believe. A lot of people who don't believe God exists are still open to demons and astrology and all sorts of weird, wacky, Mystic. like spiritual yeah, things. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Right. And I've so, heard that. so yeah. So it's just a it's a really unhelpful term, I think. And a lot of naturalist philosophers or atheist philosophers will even say, well, "I'm not a naturalist." In a conversation, you're like trying to pin them down on this argument, trying to pin them down on Some their views. Some people just don't like to be pinned and down. Yeah, babe. and they you're just like, don't like it. But you're like, look, it, your view entails such and such and shuts, and and that's false. And they'll be like. Well, I don't have that view. And so it's just, to me, it's just pointless. Like, why even go there? There's no point in starting with, with the term. Anyways, that was that was a, a rant. Got a soapbox. Moving on to... Moving on. Fine-tuning. Fine-tuning. One Make my, it short, because I know that this favorites. is your favorite thing. Make it short. I have a great way of explaining this one. Okay. okay. You ready? Of all the possible way the universe could have been... There's only a small number of ways that it could have been in order to support life. Okay. That's it. Hmm. So here's an analogy. Here's like oh an, boy. Here's an illustration that's going to make it even better and easier. Okay. So like suppose that we had a chunk of metal and a chunk of plastic. Okay, two chunks. So of all the ways that we could combine those two things together, there's only a small number of ways in which they like resemble a car or could be put in the shape of a car arranged car wise right yeah and so what is so the fine-tuning argument is kind of like this 
So what would happen if we just threw the chunk of metal and chunk of plastic together at random? Like what if we just threw it together in an, in a random arrangement? What would it look like? Probably wouldn't look like a car, right? Very, very, very unlikely it would look like a car. And so the fine tuning argument says, well, what would happen if we threw a universe together at random? Probably wouldn't support life. Probably wouldn't look anything like there had to be a maker, a, a designer, a, de a, de a designer. This one, this one is for designers. This one is for uh, this is a design argument. It's not a uh, mm. banger or, or like a creator argument. It's for a designer. So someone who who had that, like s someone who creates a car, they design the car, they put this the materials in the shape of a car and they create the car that way. So that's the fine tuning argument. OK. Is that it? Pretty proud of that one. Good job. <laughs> I think that's it. Is that eleven slash twelve? Uh, yeah. yeah. No. No, we're missing one. Oh, good epistemology. Does what does that shirt say? The good. shirt says, "Yeah, good epistemology <laughs> covers a multitude of sins." Yes, and I think I know. What, it's like ev like evangelism. No. Nope. Didn't you do street epistemology? Street, ep no. I argued against street epistemology. What did you and Tyler do? Y'all went and y'all did... We did evangel. We did evangelism. That's all we did. Okay, so then tell me... Okay, obviously I don't know what it means. Epistemology then. is the study of knowledge. That's all that it, that's all that it is. So then the what is street knowledge. epistemology? Street epistemology is, uh, is, is not about epistemology at all. It's basically, I, th I thought it was like atheists like doing what it's atheist, Christians do, it's but atheistic evangelism. talking to people about... It's atheistic evangelism. Okay. Yeah. Not street epistem... The term is really bad. It doesn't mean anything like what it actually is in reality. And they, they use some really weird things in order to, to do what they do. It's very manipulative and a lot of things wrong with it. But in, in epistemology... The formal like definition of it is just the study of knowledge. And there's a thing called religious epistemology, which is having to do with the study of knowledge when it comes to religious claims or right. beliefs. Okay. Yep. And that's a that's an area that I have a lot of interest in. I don't really talk a whole lot about on this channel, but it's an area that I have a lot of interest in. So that's pretty much it. Yeah. Well, uh, that's all my... I mean, I, I'm sure I could compile another list because... Mm -hmm. The memes keep coming. They do. And the new words and terminology keeps coming. All right. I'm looking through it. I don't see any super chats or anything. There's probably some questions in here, but it's too difficult to It's a lot to it's grab. A lot of... Yeah, it's a lot of comments. All right. Let's close this one out. Should we? All right. Should we do anything or just close it out? No. Thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Thanks for answering my questions. I don't know if anybody else has questions like I did out there maybe your about these terms maybe the wives and girlfriends hmm. have some questions have, about some terms had and... some questions they can take a look at this video um, also I will be checking out the 12 course series myself um, when it's I'm completed just, when it's completed I'm just gonna knock them all out so I think that will be helpful as well mm -hmm. yeah all right thanks guys for watching we will see you later have a good rest of the week weekend and all the good stuff. See you guys later. Bye. Bye.